author and radio host Tom Hartman is doing a deep dive into where the struggle against oligarchy in the U.S. began in his new book, The Hidden History of American Oligarchy, Reclaiming Our Democracy from the Ruling Class. Best-selling author and radio host Tom Hartman, he joins us now to discuss how oligarchs hijack the nation's economy. Tom, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hey, good morning, Sager and, and Crystal. It's great to be back with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Always great to see you. So tell us a little bit about the history that you uncover in your book. Where did it all start um, and how did we get here? Well, America's had uh, arguably four major brushes with oligarchy. The first was the one that we overthrew, the oligarchy of monarchy, that is the British government. Um, then in the 1830s, as, uh, largely, I, weirdly, as the result of the invention of the cotton gin, um, there was this massive consolidation of plantations in the South, which turned the South into an oligarchy and, you know, and a police state. And they reached out and tried to destroy democracy in the rest of our country. They failed. We pushed back the oligarchs in the, after the Civil War, broke up their plantations. In fact, Robert E. Lee's plantation is what we call Arlington National Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Then they rose again in the late 1800s and the early 1900s with the Industrial Revolution. And uh, they managed to crash the economy in 29. And Roosevelt fought them back. They, they tried to hire Smedley Butler to uh, kidnap or assassinate him and take down the government. He, he beat that and uh, put the oligarchs back in a bottle until the 1980s. And then Reagan invited them back in. And uh, now we've reached the point where this uh, relatively famous study by Gillens and Page out of Princeton in 2014 found that prior to the Reagan revolution, what the average person in America wanted actually got translated into legislation, which is why you know, in the 60s and 70s, we got Medicare and Medicaid and food stamps and housing support and all kinds of stuff. I mean, all kinds of great stuff. But since the Reagan revolution, what the bottom 90 percent want is almost never made into legislation. Instead, it's what the top 1 percent want. And that's the definition of oligarchy. We are we are not a functioning democracy right now. We are we are an early stage oligarchy. And the big danger is that oligarchies are unstable because people are really upset about the fact that they don't get what they want. And so either they flip back to democracy, which happens a small percentage of the time, or they turn into full blown police states, which is what has happened in Russia and in Hungary and in and is in the process of happening in the Philippines and in Brazil. And, you know, we've seen all around the world. So we're at a real turning point right now. Yeah, I, I think that's extraordinarily well put. And it's sort of the dynamic that you're pointing to really makes a joke of what President Obama used to always say, don't boo, vote. Well, people feel like they voted and they're still not getting the things that they thought that they were ultimately voting for. So what did you learn from the history about how these um, brushes with oligarchy ultimately come to a close? Well, Monopoly, my last book that we talked about, is the concentration of economic power in the marketplace, right, with, with big corporate actors. Oligarchy is the concentration of political power in the political marketplace, as it were, by a small number of typically very wealthy actors. And that's where we're at. And, and uh, you know, as I said, you know, once oligarchy gets going, it ends up in one of two things, either a police, a fascist police state or it collapses and goes back to democracy like happened in 1933 here in the United States. And um, if we want to go that direction, if we want to make sure that America goes back to democracy, we have to get money out of politics. This all really started in 76 and 78 when the Supreme Court and a pair of decisions, Buckley and Bellotti, um, ruled that if an individual billionaire in 76 with Buckley wants to own a politician, that's fine. That's free speech. That money is not money. Money is speech. And that's protected by the First Amendment. And then two years later in the Bellotti decision, they extended that logic to corporations. That created an ocean of cash that brought Ronald Reagan into office and continues to haunt us. It was doubled down on in 2010 by Citizens United. H.R. 1, the first piece of legislation that uh, Pelosi's trying to get out of the House and that they want to put in the Senate, will actually go a long way toward fixing that and restoring democracy in America. The problem is it can't be passed by reconciliation. So we've got people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, you know, Democrats who are going along with the Republicans on the filibuster saying, um, you know, uh, we want to we want to basically keep the, the the Senate captive to the Republicans and their oligarchs. And that's a very dangerous thing right now. Mm. 
Tom, do you think that that would ultimately be sufficient if you were able to, you know, through H.R. 1 or even, you know, more radically through a constitutional amendment, get the money out of politics? Would that be sufficient at this point? Because you have a class of political elites who, number one, are, you know, extraordinarily wealthy, very little class diversity at the federal level or even at the the state and local level. Um, Class diversity hasn't changed over the past several decades. And you also have a dynamic where people are legislating with their post-legislative careers in mind. So even if there isn't a payoff in terms of the campaign contributions and the cocktail hours and everything now, there's an expected payoff. Just look at what Paul Ryan is up to today. Just look at what John Boehner is up to today, et cetera, once they leave office. So do you think that that would ultimately be enough and be sufficient to start to return democracy to the country? Well, H.R. 1 is still being nailed, you know, hammered out, but in the earlier version that was passed by the House a couple of years ago that the Republicans refused to even allow a hearing in the Senate on, um, there was a provision that stopped that revolving door. Um, you know, Trump talked about it, <laughs> but, but he repealed it on the last mm-hmm. day of his presidency. Um, so, you know, y- yes, and that's another dimension of money in politics. We Right now, politics dances to the tune of money, and of course, money is controlled in this country by the oligarchs. We have to get politics back in the hands of the average person, and, and we actually saw that at one point. We used to celebrate, you know, average wealth. Richard Nixon, you know, when he, when he lost to John Kennedy in this famous checkers speech and said, you don't have me to kick around anymore, he talked about how his wife has a cloth coat rather than a mm-hmm. fur coat because they're just a middle-class family. The dog was a gift from somebody. Most politicians at that point in time, when we had a 91% top tax rate, the oligarchs were in a bottle. The average CEO only took 30 times what their employee took. It was illegal for corporations to buy back their stock or compensate their executive with stocks. So corporations weren't you know, mass producing billionaires and multimillionaires. Back then, we had you know, people getting what they want out of the legislative process, as I mentioned earlier. We just need to go back to that. And HR1 takes us, in my opinion, about 60 or 70 percent of the way there. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done around the edges. And, and, and in some ways, right through the middle, like you say, a constitutional convention to overt- or a, a constitutional amendment to overturn um, Citizens United and its, and its uh, earlier versions, you know, Buckley and Bilotti and McCutcheon. Um, but I, a lot of it can be done by legislation. Really and interesting. Finally, Tom, last question I had for you is, you know, given this history and the current political context of oligarchy, what did you make of the uh, Reddit uprising around GameStop? What it showed was, you know, how very, very corrupt Wall Street has become. It's, it's basically a gambling operation in many ways, and it's a gambling operation that's skewed of, by, and for the billionaires. And and, you know, with this very small technological and business innovation of, of Robinhood, you know, an app that lets you trade options without fees, suddenly you had a million people jumping into the marketplace and messing with the billionaires. And of course, the billionaires fought back and said, you can't do that and, and threatened the, you know, the company, the, the Robinhood company that we're going to cut you off from your ability to trade if you don't, you know, get the rabble under control. But, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders called it out. Elizabeth Warren called it out. Others have. Um, We have on Wall Street an extraordinarily corrupt system that only benefits oligarchs. And it needs to be reformed as well. Elizabeth Warren has a lot of good steps for that. Yeah. Really interesting, Tom. Thank you. All right, everybody, check out the book. Tom, great to see you. Great to see you, too. Thank you. Absolutely. Next up on Rising, our friend Brianna Joy Gray is going to be back on whether the Dems are capitulating or holding the line during stimulus negotiations. That one, Rising, continues.